is a good, good father. That's who he is. And he is a good father for you today. I'm Amy Schaefer with Tom Hollis on this perfectly wonderful, amazing Thursday. Somebody should make that into a song, right? I know. Good, good father. <laughs> Well, I want to speak to fathers. I want to speak to men and to anyone else who knows a man. So that's all of us, right? So coming up, our guest John Smith Baker is going to address the number one societal issue of our time. It really is. It's fatherlessness. And he will show us biblical healing and restoration for men. He's going to talk about forgiveness, guys. And it's a lot of times something we guys don't necessarily feel like we need or have to go into uh, how to forgive someone, but it is so important, especially when it's related to our fathers or to ourselves. It's an important discussion, Amy. A father is a huge deal in every human's life. Today, you're going to discover how you can be a mentor and help those who are fatherless. You're also going to learn how you can share God's love with hurting boys who are dealing with abandonment issues and understand the process of biblical forgiveness. It is time to be like the men of the Bible. And they weren't all perfect. Uh, no. No, <laughs> they were, I mean, there was a lot of crazy. So maybe you've had a lot of crazy in your life, but you know what, you can, you can stop today, you can repent, you can get right with God, and you can be the father and the man of God that he's called and purposed you to be. Absolutely. I'm, I'm sort of glad that they weren't perfect because I haven't reached that perfection level myself. Well, our next guest has a heart for helping the fatherless. John Smith Baker is an author, speaker, and the founder of Fathers in the Field. His mission is to help men recognize their God-ordained, mission-oriented roles as pastors, providers, and protectors for their family. And he joins us now to discuss the impact of fathers in the home and the call to defend the fatherless. John, welcome to Hope Today. Oh, thanks for having me, Tom and Amy. What a blessing. Well, it's so good to have you. And this clearly is, I mean, I think some people might bristle when they say, we say that this is the number one societal issue of our time, but it really is. Could you unpack that for us and, and really maybe state why, what some of the things we're seeing because of fatherlessness and what God has shown you about that issue? Yes, we, we see the effects and the ills all around this nation from the violence, suicide, uh, gender confusion, uh, emotional distress, workaholicism, alcoholicism, addictions to porn, you name it. But uh, what we have to really understand, all those are uh, efforts to numb the pain of a broken, wounded heart. And most of this is caused through the bro breakup of the family and being fatherless. And I was one of those boys. So sadly, we live in a fatherless nation now where over 50% of kids are being raised without their biological father. So the, the effect on society is profound and we need to get a handle on it as the American church. You know, I, I just have to, uh, you know, some of the stats that you provided for us are incredible about fatherlessness and what the results of that 63% of youth suicides come from a fatherless home. Now, again, this is not to say that the mothers, uh, single mothers are not doing a heroic and fantastic job in many cases, but f without the father, 71% uh, of pregnant teenagers, 85% of youth in prisons, 71% of high school dropouts, just an incredible hurdle to overcome when a father's not in the home. Yes, I mean, we, we tend to think in fleshly terms, but the soul, the soul is deeply wounded when that happens. God's plan for family and the combination of the nurturing from the mother and the masculinity from the father creates a, a, a healthy human being and allows you to share the truth of God into their life. And when that cup is broken, there are always consequences and severe consequences. So we have to just recognize that in our nation, as you can see, as it's crumbling, sadly, but uh, just in the last 40 years, you know, the marriage rate has, has just disintegrated and the father's rate has skyrocketed. If we want to know what our nation will look like, we have to look no further than the inner city. There, there's a 75% fatherlessness rate, and we see what that does to a community. In our nation, we're over 50 now, so the delta is less than 20 points. 
and we'll know what our nation looks like. If we don't get a grip and be proactive and be intentional about addressing the issue, we can no longer tell these children that it doesn't matter, you don't need a dad, big boys don't cry and you'll get over it. They need to hear just the opposite, that they were born with a glorious purpose, that they have value and they can be the man God intended them to be, but they have to heal from that fatherless wound. And that's when we get into forgiveness. Yeah. Well, you uh, briefly alluded to your own story uh, when you uh, spoke just at the top there. What, what is your story? Could you share that with us? Yes. You know, I didn't realize my ministry started when I was in my mom's womb. And that's when my, Dan, my dad abandoned his family and his post as the pastor, provider, and protector. And uh, I was on a 40-year search of how to fill that void, that, that wound deep down inside me. And I was a workaholic, I, a success, achievement oriented, because I thought that's how I would, I would find worth and value in my life and heal my soul. But praise God, when I was 40 years old, I had a road to Damascus experience when God the Father just pulled me out of the pit of hell. And when I was confessing all my earthly sins, <laughs> I, I gave them up so easily, you know, horrible sins. But then I heard the earthly father share with me that, that John, now you need to forgive your earthly father for abandoning you. Mm. And that's the sin that these boys, girls as well, but they tell themselves every day that I will never, ever forgive them. Mm. They view this abandonment, this abandoning of a fatherhood post as the unforgivable sin. And they carry this unrepentant sin in them as believers. So uh, w once I said, okay, I will, and and that's when I forgave my earthly father. That's when I knew the Holy Spirit entered me. That's when I knew I was born again and adopted into God's family because I had no unrepented sin in me and I was born again. So praise God. And I went on a mission there and God, God made it very clear, illuminated to me that I needed to give up this world and go into ministry full time and help other fatherless boys. So that's the very quick story, but it all centers on the need to forgive your father. I mean, that is so profound as a pastor of, you know, 28 years, people that hold on to unforgiveness, it goes deep into bitterness and rage and anger. You know, I watch my husband father, our two sons in the house and our daughter, and he prays over them and he blesses them and he speaks and he gives to them and he's a protector for them. And just because you have a son or a daughter doesn't necessarily make you a father. How can fathers and men be more intentional? Like what are some action steps yeah. that they can take to be that father, that man of God in their children's lives? Yeah, amen, great question. Well, it all starts with truth, right? Truth is found in the Bible. God makes it very clear that the fatherhood role is to be the pastor, provider, and protector. All three of those need to be performed in a young soul's life, or there's something missing, or you have a father wound. So practically speaking, what that means, and this is not very popular, but the father needs to be in the home mm. to perform those roles. Right. And again, people rebel at that a little bit because the divorce rate is so high. And I'm not talking about love of your children. I'm talking about performing the fatherhood roles in their life. And you need to be present in the home to do that. That's just the way God set it up. So whenever there's a crack in that covenant and, and that family is broken apart, that these children cannot have that in their life. So fathers, stay in the home, understand that your role is to pastor, provider, and protector. If you're just providing and you're not pastoring, then, then there's a, a void in your children's life. So it all starts with truth. Yeah, it's kind of hard to be the protector if you're not in the home, right? Uh, you have to be physically yes. present. Well, the book is Man Enough to Forgive. Uh, so let's talk about that process of forgiveness. And there's so much confusion about this, John, about what forgiveness is, what it isn't. You talk about in the book about uh, the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. But could you just maybe begin to walk us down that path? What is biblical forgiveness, and especially in this context? Yes, amen. Well, we're, we're talking to believers very specifically. <laughs> and once you're a believer, you should realize how much you've been forgiven, how much you've been forgiven. 
and it was unmerited, unearned, you were forgiven. So as believers, God makes it very clear in his word that forgiveness is an act of obedience. It's a command. It's not a feeling, right? It's not a feeling. It's, it, the, the excuse of it's hard is not, is not mm -hmm. rational. It's a, it's a command. So we are, we are told to forgive. We don't, our flesh rebels at that because we want a pound of flesh. We want them to acknowledge they wronged us. We want them to say they're sorry. We want all those things, but that's not what God says. No, God says we are to forgive because God has forgiven us so much. So that, that's why you have to, like you brought up, really distinguish between reconciliation and forgiveness. Most people get that confused, and it's, a, it's a kind of a hurdle for them. They say, what are you saying? I have to have a relationship with my abuser, per se, or my, that bad person? No, we're saying you have to forgive them. Reconciliation is a completely different topic that requires probably a whole other book. So we're not saying those. Separate those. Forgiveness is a command. It's not a feeling. And so that, that's the important part of it. Yeah, so let me, as you've uh, been able to have this ministry, what are the things you've seen? I know that many times when people forgive, uh, amazing things begin to happen spiritually in them and kind of in the whole situation. What have you seen? Yeah, well, spot on question. Here's the deal. Because, because, Unre sin, unforgiveness is a sin. It's an unrepented sin in your life, which basically means you have broken fellowship with the Heavenly Father. So as a believer, you're on the sidelines because you have unrepented sin in your life. God's not going to use you with unrepented sin in your life. So here's the deal. We have so many believers on the sidelines, basically on injured reserve. And as you can see in our nation, the barbarians are at the gate. We need strong, we're talking about men now, we need strong, repentant men yes. at the gate to hold back the barbarians. So really unforgiveness creates a break in fellowship with the Heavenly Father and you're on the sidelines. So if you wanna, if you wanna, what we've seen the most is once forgiveness happens, these men, their spiritual walk, their walk with the Heavenly Father, their contribution to the kingdom just skyrockets because they're not on the sidelines anymore. So you mentioned something, and I have to tell you, John, I hesitate to bring this up, the letter you wrote to your father. The reason I hesitate is there's a lot that went into your understanding before you wrote that letter. But what you encourage that. What does that yes. mean? And what was that like to write a letter to your father? Yeah, and we talk about that into the book, Man and a Forgive. Here's the deal. Men have become so calloused and tried to have moved on, per se, from their wound and their now unforgiveness in them. So they make up all kinds of excuses, right? Well, I've moved on, you know, it, it didn't really matter. He did the best he could. All those excuses signal that you have not forgiven your father. So the letter is so important because it makes official, just like God made official the Ten Commandments, right? He wrote on them. So the, the, the forgiveness letter is an official act to make it public knowledge that you have forgiven your offender, the, in this case, the father. So part of once we forgive, then there are two ways we know we've forgiven somebody. You're willing to put it in writing and share it with them. And two you start praying for them, for their salvation if they're an unbeliever. You start praying for your enemy. It's hard things to do, but if you've truly forgiven them, you will do that. So sending a forgiveness letter is the start of that journey to share Christ and what he has done for us sinners. And it's just a beautiful picture of God's reconciliation in our own lives. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as we have for, been forgiven, then we forgive. And you know, you have the book, Man Enough to Forgive, and then you have this uh, study guide, a personal study guide, and I love that you call it a masculine challenge. Masculine isn't a word that everybody uh, is ready to embrace right now, but uh, fantastically, I mean, it's an amazing book uh, uh, that you have oh, here, very you. beautiful. What do people get out of using the, uh, the study guide? Yeah, well, a, a lot of it, the processing time, the study book creates 
you know, a men's study or a personal study, but it, but it breaks it down into four series. And processing the need to forgive sometimes takes time to process in the soul and the mind and connect the mind and the heart to this command that God gives us. And when we start thinking about and all those hard questions that people are afraid to, to really talk about, we talk about it. And now you have to, as a man, be confronted with this truth, and, you, and we just pray you take the challenge. Because listen, again, men, to encourage you, you were born for a glorious purpose. Don't let unforgiveness get in your way. God has preordained great things for you to do. Don't miss that opportunity. So thank you for bringing that up, but it really allows you to interact with other men or put down your thoughts in writing, and that's really helps you process this deep, deep soul wound. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I have before we go, I've got to ask you about that word masculinity. It's so related yeah. to the to toxic masculinity. <laughs> that's kind of like the, yeah. they almost like go together. What is biblical masculinity? Yeah. Again, it all starts with truth, right? That's where we that there's no such thing as toxic masculinity. That's a word from the pit of hell because God created masculinity right. and what God creates is good. The only way we corrupt masculinity is sin. So in, if something, if a man is, is being an abuser, that has nothing to do with masculinity. That has to do with sin. So we need to call sin, sin and lead masculinity who God created and define it like God creates, which is a wonderful thing in his creation. So in the final minute that we have, could you speak to that one man out there that maybe this message is beginning to hit and just uh, maybe even pray for them and what, just how God leads you to speak to that person? Yeah, because God has given men some special roles in his creation, he loves obviously women and men the same, but he's given us different roles. And men, the devil understands those roles. And that's why he goes so hard at your heart. He goes so hard at your marriage and goes so hard at your identity. And men, part of what we have to do is point people to Christ. And the best way we do that, none of us escape this world, which is not our home, without scars and limps. And instead of being shameful of all those scars, which God heals, use those scars, point people from the wound of those scars to Christ. Let's not minimize Christ's death on that cross. All those scars that we all have, that's why Christ had to die on the cross. So instead of living in shame, live in victory, point people to your scars, use that for God's glory like I'm doing to the fatherless. And whatever your story is, point people to Christ. Don't live in the shame. Don't be embarrassed of your past. All of us have a past. All of us have scars. All of us walk with a limp. But use it for God's glory. Don't live in shame, men. You can be the man God intended you to be. It's a glorious thing when us men live in victory. And we can do great kingdom work and give God the glory. Yeah, the book's Man Enough to Forgive, Healing the Wounds of Fatherhood Abandonment by John Smith Baker. John, thank you so much for being with us. And thank you so much for your ministry. Oh, thank you, Tom and Amy. I appreciate all you do for the kingdom. God bless you guys. God bless. Wow, and forgiveness is such a huge part of our lives. May we do it and may we do it often. Listen, right after this break, I'm gonna come back and I've got a little story to tell you. I can't wait. We'll see you in a minute. When we think of the New Testament disciples, it's easy to idealize their walk with God, but they were just like you and me. They needed a great deal of help to stay on the right path. We're excited to announce that Tom Hollis has a new devotional coming out this June. Spirit Walk follows the apostles as they attempt to follow Christ, as reflected through the book of Acts. Their experiences can be ours as well. All we need to do is follow the Spirit. Enjoy 40 short devotional entries and discover how the journey of the apostles relates to us today. Spirit Walk includes a daily verse, prayer, and space to journal your personal reflections. Be among the first to receive Tom's devotional, which releases June 12th. Ask for your copy of Spirit Walk when you give today. 
call 888-665-4483 or go to ctvn.org slash donate. Thank you for your generosity. Hope happens here. It's pretty cool to be sitting here with the <laughs> Tom Hollis that wrote a book called Spirit Walk. Oh, it you know, I love the book of Acts. Yes. And, and just as I read through it, I just let the Lord kind of speak to me about what things he wanted to share out of there. So I know everyone will enjoy it. It'll bless you. At least you. I hope so. Yes, make sure you get that. You know, um, as they were talking today about men and about fathers and I, I remembered a story that I heard a pastor tell and he said there's this story of this man his son was on the boat and his son's friend were on the boat they were out fishing all day they got far away from shore and unbeknownst to them a great storm was arising and this great storm created huge waves and these huge waves rocked the boat so ferociously that both the son and the son's friend go out of the boat and into the water. They are struggling for their life and this father is standing there with one lifesaver ring and he has to make a decision. Who do I save? my son or my son's best friend. And he said, in that quick moment, my son knows Jesus. My son is going to heaven. He said, but his fr best friend doesn't know Jesus, doesn't know the Lord. And if he were to die today, he would not go to heaven. And he said, so I said goodbye to my son and I threw the life ring out to my son's best friend. Now, I mean, just like take that in for a moment and, and picture if that was you. And everybody in the audience said, yeah, right. That story is false. It's a joke. It's made up. No father would ever do that. Save not his son, but his son's best friend. <clears throat> and he said, actually, I was the son's best friend. And that father threw that life ring to me. And because he did, I now know Jesus. I thought about the scripture in Romans 8, verse 31. What shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Verse 38, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love that God has for us that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. How far have you gone? What have you done? Is it so bad? Is it so vile? Is it in the depths of, you can't even imagine God's love reaching you there? I say, that's exactly what God's love does. That there is nothing, no, no sin that you have committed, no unforgiveness that you may hold that can separate you from the love of God today. So Tom and I together, man, we're agreeing that's that right. today will be a life change in your life life, that today you'll draw a line in the sand and God has called you to be a man of God, to forgive, to let go. He's, he's throwing you a lifeline today. He's throwing you a lifesaver and that lifesaver was his son, Jesus Christ. And if he had to do it all again, he would do it just for you. So I want you to give us a call today at 888-665-4483. And I want you to receive God's love into your heart. It is life changing. It is life transforming. It is really from death unto life. 
and today is your day. Ask Jesus to come into your heart, to forgive you of your sins. Say, God, help me forgive others. Forgive me, help me. And guess what? Jesus comes in and he is the Lord of your life and he changes everything. So today, Tom, I believe it's not the time and the season to be playing games. No, today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. You know, God's got enough life rings for all of us. He's, got, he's, he's throwing them out there, but you've got to take hold of it. Mm -hmm. He could throw 50 of them out there and then you could be like, no, I'm going to swim. Right. I'm going to swim. I got this. I'm going to swim. No, we can't do that. We can't save ourselves. We can't uh, do enough good works to make up for the wrong things we've done. We can't do anything. It says that all our righteousness is as filthy rags in the scriptures. In other words, we can't do this good things to overtake the sins that we've committed against God, but we can grab on to that life ring. We can grab on to the, the one who can forgive us and wants to forgive us and is offering salvation. God is standing with hands outstretched like this. Can you turn away from that? Don't turn away from that. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and come running into the arms of the Father, running into the arms of the Savior. He'll pull you up just like he did Peter. Peter was sinking, to go on with the, uh, the lifesaver analogy. He was sinking and G he said, Lord, save me. And, he, and Jesus reached down and pulled him up. When we understand that we cannot save ourselves. We cannot swim enough. We can't tread water enough for our salvation. Uh, we understand that we need a savior. Jesus said that for God so loved the world that he gave, he gave his only begotten son that whoever, whoever, that's you and me, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is the time God is offering you everlasting life don't turn away, don't turn away today. As Amy said, ask him, invite him into your life, ask for forgiveness of your sins, ask uh, him to take the lordship of your life and say, I'm gonna follow you the rest of my life. He will empower you, he will change you, and it will be a new day and a new path. On tomorrow's Hope Today, face life's challenges with everyday wisdom for every man best-selling author Robert Wolgamuth shares the reliable text of the Christian Standard Bible filled with helpful, easy-to-understand resources designed to encourage men in their walk with God. That's what's on tomorrow's Hope Today. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.